This is Istanbul and modern Turkey. To the west lies Europe, to the east, Asia, stretching all the way to India and China. I'm Matthew Settle. In 334 BC, Alexander, king of the tiny Greek kingdom of Macedon, crossed this neck of water and headed east into the mighty Persian Empire ruled by Darius III. Both Alexander and Darius had one ambition, to rule the known world. In the war that followed, the winner would take all. The decisive battle was fought three years later, on 1st October 331 BC, on the dusty plain of Galgamela. Now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wish they'd had. Now, in decisive battles. The chain of events that led to this great battle began far away from the dusty plains of Persia. In 356 BC, a son was born to King Philip of Macedon and his wife Olympias. His name was Alexander. Philip was the most powerful king in Greece, but the various states were difficult to hold together. He saw a war against Greece's old enemy, Persia, as a way of uniting the country and making himself all-powerful. But Philip had problems at home. He already had six wives, and in 337 BC, he married a seventh, a young teenager named Cleopatra. Olympias was furious. She feared her son Alexander might never become king. The following year in 336 BC, Philip was assassinated. Everyone suspected that the murder was organized by Olympias. And as she'd hoped, her 20-year-old son Alexander inherited Philip's throne and his ambition to conquer Persia. I think Persia was the dragon that he needed to slay. It was, uh, it was like sacking Troy times a hundred. The Persian Empire was vast, stretching all the way from modern-day Turkey, through Iraq and Iran, to Afghanistan and northern India. But this spurred Alexander on. He was insatiably curious. He wanted to see the lands that lay beyond Persia and the ocean that was believed to encircle Europe and Asia at the edge of the earth. Alexander was a hunter and a conqueror, and he set himself no limits. His first task was to defeat the existing Persian Empire. Second task, to recover the old Persian Empire, which he would have known about, which extended over the Hindu Kush into what's now Pakistan. Third goal, well, the limit, which was, as the Greeks thought, the ocean. He just simply wanted to go on until he hit the Eastern Ocean. He was competing with Achilles, with Heracles, um, and he wanted to leave a name that would live forever and ever. In 334 BC, he arrived here in Turkey with an army of 40,000 men. Although basically Macedonian, the army included troops from all over Greece and a large number of mercenaries. At its heart were the companion cavalry, an elite unit of around 1,600 men. Alexander's particular contribution was that he led the companion cavalry, the crack cavalry force, in person. And he had done so from the age of 18. So the troops would know that their leader was not just there because he was the son of the previous king, but because he was one of the finest horsemen in the entire army. Alexander's companion cavalry were probably the greatest cavalry ever in the history of the world. They were companions of the king. They were the elite of all Macedonia who could call Alexander Alexander and who were his, his friends, his mates. The Persian army was sent to throw this young upstart back across the Hellespont. The two sides met at the River Granicus. Alexander led the cavalry charge across the river. He rode straight for Mithridates, the son-in-law of Darius, and plunged his lance into his face, killing him outright. Then two Persian generals attacked Alexander. 
One dented his helmet with a sword swipe, but was killed by Alexander. The second general came at him with an axe, but as he raised it, his arm was cut off at the shoulder by one of Alexander's companions. The rest of the Macedonian cavalry and infantry raced across the river. The Persians turned and ran. Alexander drove on eastwards through Asia Minor. He believed that fate had marked him out for greatness. Now the Persian king, Darius, decided to take charge himself. He raised another army and met the Macedonians in November 333 BC at Issus. Darius heavily outnumbered Alexander, but the battleground was not large enough for him to use his superior force to advantage. Once again, Alexander's cavalry smashed through the Persian line. Darius fled with such haste that he left his mother, wife, and daughters behind. They became Alexander's captives. Meanwhile, thousands of Persian troops were cut down as they made their retreat. These victories made Alexander the master of all those lands to the west of his advance. These now included Egypt, which Persia had ruled for 200 years. He traveled there, and as Egypt's new pharaoh, founded the city of Alexandria. He then made a pilgrimage to the shrine of the god Ammon. This was at the Siwa Oasis, near the border with Libya, and involved a trek of several hundred miles across the desert. Questions to Ammon were answered through a priest. Alexander asked, will I rule the earth? The answer seems to have been yes. But the priests went further. They greeted Alexander, calling him the son of God. 2,000 years after his desert pilgrimage, Greek coins still depict Alexander as the ram-headed god Ammon. All those who knew Alexander claimed Egypt had changed him. In his own mind, he had become godlike and invincible. By July 331 BC, his army was ready for the push eastwards into the heartland of Persia. Three months later, he crossed the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Darius was waiting for him on the plain of Galgamela. The Persian king had learned from his defeat at Issus. Galgamela, which means the camel's house, was absolutely flat. Darius chose to fight here so that he could use his cavalry and chariots to full advantage. He would gamble everything on stopping Alexander once and for all. For if his army was defeated here, the entire Persian empire would have a new ruler, Alexander the Great. Battle of Galgamela. It is 331 BC. Alexander the Great is battling against the army of Darius of Persia. At stake, control of Asia, and the Black Sea to the borders of India. Darius, his army was huge, a quarter of a million men, outnumbering Alexander's five to one. Curtius Rufus, a historian of the time, described how the Persian army snaked across the desert. First came the cavalry, drawn from all parts of the empire. Next in line were crack infantry troops, known as the Immortal, so-called because their numbers were never allowed to drop below 10,000. 10,000 spearmen, then 30,000 foot soldiers, and 400 of his own royal horses. 600 mules and 300 camels carried the king's treasure, which in today's terms would be worth over $3 billion. Alexander's army, in comparison, was rough and ready, and much smaller. 40,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry. It was a confident army. Alexander, at the head of his companion cavalry, led from the front. The Macedonians really were a band of brothers. They really were companions. Every night, they would eat together, dine together, drink together. They were, um, if you look down the rolls, there was brothers, cousins, uncles, everybody was related to each other by marriage, by, by blood. And uh, you know that Alexander just loved these guys and they loved him. The flat plain at Galgamela was well suited for chariot warfare, but Darius went one further and had the ground leveled out to provide runways for his charioteers. This would be a huge set piece battle, the kind the Persians had trained for. The vast battlefield would allow Darius to send all of his troops into action and use his five to one advantage to smash Alexander. A key objective was to break up the massed spearmen of the phalanx. This was notoriously difficult to do. If 
Darius had a plan. Scythed chariots. These were standard chariots with long, sharp blades attached to the wheel hubs, capable of separating a man or horse from its legs. They were driven at speed into massed infantry with one aim, breaking up enemy ranks and creating gaps for their own cavalry and infantry. We now know how Darius deployed his army because his written instructions were captured after the battle. On the left wing were Bactrian and Scythian cavalry from the steppes of Asia. Their job was to halt the charge of the companion cavalry. Darius had set up Galgamela to have a tremendous amount of heavy cavalry of his own fronting his left so that Alexander would have to fight through rank after rank of really crack horsemen. The Persians themselves were in the center of the line with the king and his royal entourage. In front of Darius were the baggage elephants and another 50 chariots. On the right wing, were troops from Syria, Mesopotamia, and the Persian Gulf, and 100 charioteers and scythe-wheeled chariots. Like all Greek commanders before him, Alexander organized his infantry in a phalanx formation. These blocks of troops presented a wall of spears to the enemy. The first five ranks leveled their spears to the front, while those to the rear held their spears at 75 degrees to deflect incoming javelins. But unlike previous commanders, he combined the power of the phalanx with the flexibility of a fast-moving cavalry attack. The Macedonian army, as developed by Philip first and, and perfected by Alexander, was really like the smart bomb of the ancient world. It was light years beyond the, 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 the Greek phalanx, which was essentially just heavy infantry advancing in a solid front and beating each other's brains out. It was a style of battle that's sometimes called uh, sword and shield battle. Uh, the Macedonian phalanx functioned as a shield and the companion cavalry acted as the offensive sword. At Galgamela, Alexander organized a phalanx of Macedonians with cavalry on either side. But he also placed a rear phalanx behind them, made up of mercenaries and allies. He knew that his own adventurous cavalry tactics could leave his infantry vulnerable to attack from the flanks and the rear. His second phalanx would deal with such a threat. Alexander didn't seem to suffer from pre-battle nerves. In fact, he overslept. It was high noon by the time he joined his troops. The two armies advanced in the line of battle. Darius had the terrain on his side. The wide plain was perfect for him to deploy his superior numbers and, of course, his cavalry. At five to one, the Persians far outnumbered Alexander. In order to avoid being outflanked, Alexander led his cavalry off to the right, towards the edge of the Persian line. Darius's cavalry moved off in the same direction to keep pace with Alexander. These outflanking maneuvers worked to Alexander's advantage, drawing both sides away from the ground which had been specially cleared for Darius's chariots. Darius saw what was happening and ordered his left wing to advance. To avoid being surrounded, Alexander charged straight into the Persians. What Alexander looked for in his battles was an opening in the enemy formation. As soon as he saw that, Alexander would lead a charge of his companion cavalry straight at that gap. The Battle of Galgamela was underway. It was big in every sense. 300,000 men fighting over miles of desert with the Persian Empire as the prize. Alexander's charge seemed suicidal. It was a terrible struggle with the Macedonians heavily outnumbered. Well, they always say that when you're fighting against uh, superior odds, it's like, it's like wrestling a bear. You gotta get your, your blade into his heart before his paws wrap around you and crush you to death. The cavalry battle left the Macedonian phalanx unprotected. 
Darius decided that now was the moment to smash it apart with his side-wheeled chariots. One hundred of them stood ready to be launched against the Macedonian spearmen. Once the phalanx was broken, Darius's army could encircle Alexander and his cavalry, and the young king's Persian adventure would come to a bloody end. The Battle of Galgamela. It is 331 BC. Alexander the Great is battling against the army of Darius of Persia. At stake, control of Asia, and the Black Sea to the borders of India. Darius has decided to send his side chariots into action. The charioteers race toward the Greek phalanx. Ahead of them was a wall of razor-sharp spears. And for the men of the phalanx, there was a side of a hundred chariots bearing down on them, each with three-foot-long scapel-sharp blades whizzing around the wheel hubs. But Alexander's battle-hardened troops held their nerve. At the last moment, when the chariots were almost on top of the phalanx, they opened their ranks and the chariots passed harmlessly through. For the charioteers, however, there was little hope. As they drove down the open-ended ranks, hundreds of javelins and spears finished them off. He had really crack javelineers and archers out front, and uh, he was able to fire at the horses. If you just would nail one horse in a four-horse team, that would completely, you know, the whole team would go. Meanwhile, Alexander and his cavalry had gained the upper hand. The rise took cavalry from the center of his line to send his reinforcements. As they moved, they left a gap. Alexander spotted it immediately, wheeled to the left and charged straight into the gap and straight at the Persian king. At only one point on the field did Alexander achieve numerical superiority, but that was at the crucial point when he was charging at Darius. The Macedonian phalanx followed right behind Alexander. The Persian battle line was broken. Once again, Darius turned and fled. When the rest of his army saw their king and his entourage fleeing, they naturally figured, well, if he's fleeing, why are we still standing here risking our lives? But the battle was far from over. Part of the Persian cavalry managed to break away and attacked Alexander's left wing cavalry. And if that uh, wing of Alexander's army were to have given way, um, particularly given way soon, uh, that would have unhinged Alexander's whole battle plan uh, and probably prevented him from winning a victory, if not led to outright defeat. But once again, the brilliance of Alexander's tactics saved the day. He had created the rear phalanx for just such an emergency. Now it swung into action and came to the rescue pushing back the Persian cavalry. When the word got out that Darius had run away, the huge Persian army began to retreat. Now the whole Macedonian army rushed forward on the heels of the Persians. Darius abandoned everything as he fled for his life. At Issus, he had left his wife and his daughters. This time at Galgamela, vast amounts of treasure, weapons, and even the royal chariot were left behind. But Darius had gotten away again. Casualty figures in ancient battles often owed more to propaganda than to fact. The Greek historian Arion reports that Alexander lost only 100 men, while Darius lost 300,000. Even allowing for such huge exaggeration, the Persians would have suffered very heavy losses. Armies suffered their worst casualties when in full-scale retreat. Alexander pursued Darius for nine months, but the two would never meet again. Darius was stabbed by one of his own generals and left by the roadside to die. Alexander wrapped his own cloak around the dead king. He had Darius's murderers executed and gave him a royal funeral. Gargamela was the most important victory that Alexander won um, in that it broke the organized resistance of the Persian Empire. After Galgamela, Alexander was unstoppable. He and his companions from the tiny kingdom of Macedon swept on through Persia. One year later, they were in Afghanistan. Four years later, they crossed the Hindu Kush mountain range and invaded northern India. Alexander was fulfilling the prophecy of the priests of Ammon. He was close to becoming master of 
of the known world. In 323, Alexander returned to Persia. One night, he attended a drinking party. He suddenly yelled and complained of a pain that felt like a spear in his chest. He lapsed into fever. Barely conscious, he was asked to whom he would leave his kingdom. He replied, to the strongest. If anyone deserves the right to be judged by the standards of his own time and not by our standards, it's Alexander. He fought as a hero. He was not a cold-blooded, calculating general like, say, Caesar or, or even Napoleon to some extent. He was there in the forefront on his horse, Bucephalus, charging right in there, and he believed that that was what it was all about. On June 11th, he died at the age of 32. He wasn't a god after all. His body was covered in the scars of battle. He had been seriously injured eight times and wounded by every form of weapon, sword, spear, arrow, and javelin. His body was embalmed by Egyptians and taken not to his homeland of Macedonia, but to Alexandria, named after the greatest commander the world had ever seen. His empire did not survive him. No one man was strong enough to inherit his mighty legacy. Instead, it was divided among his generals. Never again would one man conquer so much.